Hello and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be doing a video titled, What is a Biblical Marriage? Because a lot of people think they know what a biblical marriage is, and they actually don't know what a biblical marriage is, or at least how God views marriage. Alright, so, you know, Christianity and the world today have their own idea of what a marriage is, right? And what it should be, okay? Even with the, the alphabet community, you know, the LG, whatever, thinking that they can marry whoever and everything along those lines. And some of them will even say, like, yeah, God blessed me with him and stuff like that, right? Like, stuff that's obviously wrong. So God actually has a very different view in mind, okay? And today we're going to be going over what the biblical marriage is and what it is not, okay? So, the origins of marriage. Let's go to uh, Genesis 2.18. Sorry about my dog. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Okay, so notice that the woman was originally created to be a help meet for her husband, right? The word meet means suitable, proper, qualified, fit, etc. Okay, so she was in help suitable for her husband, right? qualified fit for her husband so she's supposed to meet his needs his he, she's helping him right so genesis 3 23 through 24 and adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh okay so notice the picture of marriage T today is being one flesh with your wife, right? Or your husband, whoever's listening to this. One flesh with your spouse. So Eve was bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. So they were literally one with each other, but separate, right? And notice it says, uh, Therefore shall a man leave his mother, his father and his mother, okay? Well, Adam and Eve didn't have a father and mother, like, physically speaking. So that's to us today. So our example of a marriage is becoming one in the flesh, right? Well, that's a physical thing, right? Okay. So they're one in the flesh. So look at Genesis 5, 2. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam, called their name Adam in the day when they were created. God himself takes it so far as to even call them collectively Adam together rather than Adam and Eve. Hence, the old way of referring to a married couple is like Mr. and Mrs. Jonathan Perkins, right? If you're married. Or whatever example, you get the point though, right? So, and notice the immediate knock at the uh, alphabet community again in transgenders, right? Marriage is male and female. Just like gender is male and female. There's no surprise there, hopefully, to anybody listening to this. So, to back up the interpretation, let's look at Genesis 24, 67, okay? That marriage is a physical union. That's what God refers to as a marriage, okay? Genesis 24, 67. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death, after his mother's death, Okay? So notice she became his wife when he had taken her into the tent. They joined flesh in the tent, and she became his wife, right? So they had sex. That's marriage in God's eyes. Okay, let's look at a few more real fast. Genesis 16.3, And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, or Hagar, I don't, I don't know, Hagar or Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. So, marriage involved. His wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. So, notice, to be his wife, they had the physical union there. He went in unto her, right? Look at Genesis 30, verse 4. And she gave him Bilhah her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went in unto her. So, to be his wife, went in unto her, the physical union again. Genesis 39, when Leah, 
saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. So notice, the, the wiving, the, uh, the marriage, the wedding, the being married always has to do with a physical union, right? It's becoming one in the flesh, like it was originally said in Genesis, okay? So, notice the original marriage was seen as flesh joining flesh. That's how God viewed it. It was something physical. Amen? Okay, so now look at Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees. Let's go to Matthew 19. We'll read verses 3 through 12. So, this will take a minute, but we're going to read it all. So, the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So, every cause, right? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Right? So Jesus is showing that it's that physical union, that's what marriage is. Verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were born, which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Okay, so there's a lot there, so let's kind of break it down a little bit. So Jesus makes the same male and female, flesh and flesh statement, right? Flesh joining flesh. So it's the physical union. He, his comments about let no man put asunder is a reference to man or woman joining their flesh to another's flesh. So that's what is said was adultery, right? Marriage is supposed to be a physical and spiritual union between man and woman forever. That's what he's saying. Okay, so in verse 9, the putting asunder, fornication, right? Look at verse 9 real quick. Verse 9 says, And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. So he said, let no man put asunder. So the putting asunder would have to do with flesh joining flesh again, right? That's what marriage is in God's eyes. Okay, look at verse 12 regarding marriage. Right? Verse 12 shows without a doubt it's physical. He refers to eunuchs. Eunuch in the King James Bible is a male that has no use for a woman or literally physically cannot be with a woman in the context, right? So it's showing that it's physical. Amen? So the reasoning for divorce and polygamy being allowed in the Old Testament is because of the hardness of their hearts. That's what Jesus said in verse 8, which Jesus says was not how it was supposed to be from the beginning. Now Jesus is telling them, because of this new dispensation, it's going to go back to how it was, you know, from the beginning, how it was supposed to be. Because now we have the new birth, we have the influence and the transforming of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So, we're supposed to be with one man and one woman, right? This is why us believers are called the Bride of Christ. Okay, let's look at Ephesians uh, chapter 5. Verse 30 through 32. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Right? That's marriage. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Look at that. Revelation 21 verse 9 calls the Lamb's bride his wife. So, we are the bride of Christ. We are one, right? Look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So notice that. It's in you, 
right? It's that it's that connection there making you one. His spirit is in us. Okay. Okay, so now watch what Paul had just said a little earlier in 1 Corinthians 16 or 1 Corinthians 6 verses 15 through 17. Okay. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? So that's a, a whore, right? A prostitute. God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. There's marriage. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Okay? That's why fornication is so serious in the Bible. Because Paul literally just told you that joining to an harlot is becoming one body. Flesh joining flesh. That sex and sex is viewed as marriage to God. Right? It's the same wording, same terminology. So God views sex as marriage. That's why it's such a big deal for fornication and adultery, right? Yeah, he literally said, uh, make them the members of an harlot. Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Right? Notice that. Okay. Now look at John four sixteen through 19. Okay. Let's look at what Jesus says to the woman at the whale. Whale. The woman at the well, I meant. Sorry. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So the woman was a harlot, regularly sleeping with five men, right? She's sleeping with five different men, and the one that she has is currently not her husband, he says, okay? And she doesn't say, like, you're lying or denied or anything. She perceives him as a prophet because he's literally able to speak the truth, right? So notice he said that even the husband you have now is not your husband, meaning the man she slept with recently was already married to someone else. Okay, so this is seen in 2 Samuel 2.15, where Bathsheba is referred to as Uriah's wife. Then in verse 24, Bathsheba is referred to as David's wife. It's that physical sexual union, right? So she belonged to Uriah, but David committed adultery and fornication with her, making her his wife as well. Notice that. Okay, so look at 1 Timothy 3 verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, right? Notice it's one wife. That's how God had intended it from the beginning. Okay, so now jump to 1 Corinthians seven thirty nine. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So Paul says in Christ, right? So the ideal marriage is one man and one woman who are in Christ, so they are saved. Okay, so now that we understand that sex is marriage in the eyes of God, what about getting engaged, right? What's the, the purpose and the point of that? So this is actually something that is referred to in the Bible, and God takes it very seriously. So we are said to be espoused to Christ as a virgin, yet we are his wife and bride, right? Look at 1 Corinthians 11 too. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Right? Look at Matthew 1, uh, 18 through 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So they're engaged. Verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Okay, so notice that it literally says her husband, but it also says that they're only engaged. So God takes it so seriously that he's already considering them husband and wife before they even come together physically. Okay, so even though marriage in God's eyes is the physical joining of flesh, he takes engagement seriously, and it's good for Christian testimony as well, like no premarital sex and stuff like that. 
which sex is marriage in God's eyes, but we understand the testimony of everything and just it being a good look on uh, the unsaved and the world and everything like that and a good testimony for other Christians to witness your walk and everything along those lines. I'm not against that at all. I got engaged to my wife and everything as well, and we got saved, and our marriage is viewed as legitimate in the Lord's eyes, and thank God for that, right? Amen. So, we have everything. We've we've established what marriage is in God's eyes. We've established what engagement is in God's eyes. So next time, next video, I'm going to establish, establish and discuss the Christian marriage and its roles in the husband and wife's duties to each other. Amen. I hope this video was a blessing. I hope it was well understood. And uh, I hope it was edifying to everybody that listened to it, and I hope it opened your eyes to what marriage is in God's eyes and why it's so important about adultery and fornication and being one in the flesh forever. Let no man put asunder. Amen. Thank you for watching, and God bless.